Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 29, fresh review. Remember, uh, Ephesians is talking about how to improve the proper right relationship with husband and wife. So we've uh, finally, uh, we've already kicked the women. Now we're going to kick the men. Uh, I've been kicking the men. Now I have to continue kicking the men. Verse 29, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh. That's true. No man hated himself, his own body. He always cherished it. That's why you always fall into whatever you desire in your body. But nourisheth and cherisheth it. Now that's very important. Is that the body of a man is known to be something that is cherished. So you cherish it. You nourish it. So the thing is, is that sometimes you men have to look at yourself, and I know that sometimes the woman may be a little bit more sensitive than you, and I know that sometimes that the woman, that she, uh, she may not be as strong and tough as you, especially if you're on the mission field, and it requires a lot of dedication and sacrifice on the wife's part to labor they are more sensitive, they are more prone to pain and hurt than the man. So I know that may be the case, and you're like wondering, why isn't it that my woman, she wouldn't be able to be more strong? Why won't the wife be more bold for Jesus Christ and etc.? But that's the thing is that if you look at verse 29, the Bible says it's nourisheth and cherisheth it his own flesh. I mean, you do that to your own body too. Your own body... You, what you do is that you gratify whatever this body is sensitive to. Even as the Lord, the church. So the Lord and the church, they obviously have a relationship as husband and wife. So as husband and wife with God and the church, remember that it relates to husband and wife. So Jesus Christ nourishes cherisheth you likewise you should be doing that with your wife so in other words you have to ask yourself how many times has the lord been very gentle to you on the christian walk in holiness because think about it god many times thought of you this way that why can't you be stronger for me why can't you tough it out because I suffered much more for you on the cross of Calvary. So why is it that you can't face the trials? Why is it that you're always so sensitive? Why do you cry so often? Shouldn't you be a soldier for Jesus Christ and etc.? But if God put, God understands if he put us to his level. Did you understand that? Did you hear that? If God put us in his level of endurance then you got to realize we would have dropped dead a long time ago because God is full of perfection and holiness. And he knows that mankind, that they're unable to attain that. That's the same thing is that women, they are made differently. And I know that's unpopular in today's day and age. No matter how much they preach about equal rights and man is equal to woman, look, it is unfair if you have a guy participate in a woman's sports competition and claim that he won fair and square no matter how much you argue that the guy really is a woman deep down inside so look at first peter so keep your bookmark here and go to the book of first peter chapter three now you women need to understand that actually this is to your benefit right this is to your benefit that you acknowledge that you're made differently from the man you're more sensitive you require more nourishment and cherishing compared to the man, right. and you're way more sensitive. Right. You have to acknowledge that, women. As much as you don't like to hear that, then trust me, you don't want a man to treat you to his level, then you break yeah. down easily in the ministry. Right. So you know what this day and age is? They're so brainwashed to think that a man, they're dropping down the man right. to the women's level of sensitivity and normalcy so that's the reason why you get wham wham people today who can't stand a five-minute sermon on hellfire right. 
You know why? Oh, that's so offensive. You get some guy uh, walking out the back door of a church, and I bet you he's wearing pink underwear. You know why? Because I, oh, the preacher should be too nice. Who, who taught you that? Who taught you that? So you know why? Because man has, men have lost their manhood. Why is that? Because we're living in a society that, oh, uh, we're all equal. So women can do it too. We should all be equal. But they have to bring down the man to the woman's level. So then be more sensitive. Be more touchy-feely. And guess what? When you get both of them down here, then you know what happens? It gets worse. It drops lower. Yes. Yes. It drops lower. The toughness drops lower. The discipline drops lower. And then the sensitivity rises higher. But look at this one. With God and the church in their relationship, if God understands that he has to be his level and that man has to be, mankind is at their own level, and God realizes we're different. I don't care what you say, we're different. Right. So what I'm going to do is understand your level, nourish and cherish, cherish you, but I cannot compromise what I am. And what happens is when you drop to their level, then what happens is the woman, she gets uh, used to it and she even becomes stronger herself. Then guess what? Then it increases. You got to realize biblical Christianity is all about soldier strength and pressing through trials. You got great women of God throughout the past years of history whose pregnant women were torn apart so that their babies were just fed to the swine and the pigs and they did not deny the name of Jesus Christ. Now, you know where they get that toughness, that strength from? So why? Because that is the mindset of biblical Christianity. That is the mindset of biblical Christianity. It's warfare, strength, not being coddled. But how do we attain to that level? When we understand women are women and men are men. Men, that's why they're more uh, prone to that uh, warfare, strength, and aggressive mentality. And God says that's the Christian warfare. Christian warfare is like that. Well, women, they can't just suddenly become like that. That's why it's hard for you men and you go like, why can't a woman be like that for Jesus Christ? Because she's made differently from you. You have to understand that. So then you have to nourish, cherish them. And what happens is, is that if you don't compromise your standing, who you are, she grows along together with you in the toughness, in the strength. And by the way, it works the other side too. It also teaches the man himself more about gentleness, yeah. nourishment, and patience. <laughs> patience, okay? Patience. So the thing is, is that God Almighty, He understands that. He understands that. That's why we're living in an age of grace, and salvation is a free gift, yeah. and it's full of love. And God has been very patient to us. So what happens is it works both sides if you both realize you're both different. And when you both become one together, realizing your distinct roles but equal as one for the work of Jesus Christ, you rub off on each other. Yeah. On each other's distinct characteristics that rubs off in a good way. But if you make everything like an equality, you're not trying to make a man equalized with a woman. What you're trying to equalize the man and the woman to is your liberal propaganda, oh. sensitive brainwash mentality of what the right level of normalcy is. That's humanism. That's wickedness sent from hell. All right, does any of this make sense? Amen. So look at 1 Peter chapter 3. Notice what the Bible says about verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, the wives, according to knowledge, Giving, look at this, honor unto the wife. Oh, the, the wife should honor me. But guess what? You'd be surprised. The man has to honor the wife too. You know why? She deserves to be treated with respect. Yes, she obeys you. She respects you. But guess what? She's not the one that opens the door for you all the time when you walk inside the house. And she's the one that carries your luggage and mess. Where is, where is the gentleman mentality 
where men have to, uh, the men carry the stuff for the women, open the door for the women, and give them respect. Oh, I'm sorry, we lost that because nowadays uh, women get offended and say, why are you treating me like this? Yeah. No, it's about matter of respect, but if you want to lose your respect, then go ahead. And men have lost the respect for women. And some of them taking it to aggressive level of abuse, of abuse and think that they're lords. But no, you have to give honor to them. Why? Because as unto the weaker vessel. So you have to understand they're weaker than you. That's why you have to cherish and nourish them. Why? They're made differently. Why? Not because that uh, women that you're just uh, that you you are just weak yourself. The reason why is because God created you to have more estrogen than the men. Because we would be doomed to be in your shoes too if we had more estrogen. All right. <laughs> But why did God do that? The estrogen is done where there's that uh, gentle side and then it teaches the man to understand that empathy as well. Because men, men do have a problem with that. Men do have a problem with that. So when the man learns to cherish and nourish the wife, cherish and nourish the wife, then what happens is that he learns gentleness and patience why should he do that? Because verse 7, he has to recognize this. Listen, you got to get this through your head, man. Hello. She is different from you. Do you understand that? Right. If you understand that, it will be very helpful to you. Because then you'll, you won't get frustrated with her. Right. You won't get angry at her. You won't uh, try to beat her down. You're going to realize that, look, she's different from me. I have to understand that. They're more prone to sensitivity. They're more empathetic, right. and they feel things more than I do. Right. So I have to be very careful. Men, you uh, you don't feel a lot, okay? No, but today, we, now we're getting to a level where they're trying to make you feely, 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 and it makes you sick. But aside from that, exactly. men, you don't feel a lot. You're more prone to the uh, testosterone level of more aggression and doing things. So you must understand that this is a lesson for you and it's a learning level for you. So that's why the Lord's putting you through a patience experience. All right. If you realize she's different from you, then you're going to stop comparing her to you. Yeah. All right. You got to stop that. Don't compare her to you and think that uh, she has to be at your quote unquote spiritual level or your level of what real life should be. You got to knock that off of your mind. That's good. All right. Sometimes you got to realize that uh, for a woman, it is very hard if there are no flowers in the home for some women. All right. I'm not saying all, but or they would just want a little touch of, you know, it should be a little bit more clean or more organized, etc. All right. I know that you might argue that Jesus had uh, no pillow to lay his head on and he didn't have a roof over his head, woman. So we got to learn to be strong for Jesus Christ. But you got to realize this. Jesus is not a woman. Yeah. All right. Jesus is a man like you. Okay. So you have to understand women are different. All right, go, going back, going back. Then it becomes then impossible. Do you realize that? Realizing that she is totally different from you and that you have to treat her like uh, gentleness and cherishing and nourishing, then that makes it impossible for you men to abuse the wife, right. even mentally abuse the wife. It's totally impossible. Why? Because the woman is really deep in mental thought, in empathy and touchy feeling that if she feels something that really hurts her, then you can't do that. Right. <laughs> See? Right. So you got to realize that makes it impossible. It makes it impossible for the woman to uh, be abused or even feel abused. So sometimes you don't recognize it yourself if you offended the woman. So uh, you have to tell yourself this is that it's not where... You think what, uh, it's not what you think what may not hurt her or may hurt her. It's to her how she feels. Yes, so if she does not feel like you cherish and nourish her, if she doesn't feel like that, then even though you think you cherish and nourish her, you're wrong probably right. because your thinking is different from her thinking. Does that make sense? That's going to improve. A, see this? This is going to improve the relationship drastically. 
If the woman submits to the leadership of the man and does her part and not let her woman instincts and her woman nature control and dominate the man to what society is doing, and if man understands that woman, she is what she is, so he has to go down to her level and can't do anything uh, that makes her feel more sensitive, to, that hurts her, then what happens is the relationship becomes powerfully intact yes. and strong Amen. and successful. Amen. Now, going back to our main point here. Verse 30. For we are members of his body. So obviously we're members of God's body. So this body of man and man Note, remember, back at Genesis was made in the image of God. God treats his body well, so that's why man should treat his body well. Why? Because the woman came from the body of a man. Uh, you know the story at Genesis chapter 2. That's why women are called woman. Why? Because they came from the man. But we live in a day and age, they even take offense to the word woman. Why? Because it's just... Uh, it's just paying attention to the man, 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 man. Well, I don't know what you want to be called, but might as well be called an it nowadays. So yeah. these femi uh, th this is so out of hand now. They're getting rid of uh, the label of father and mother. Some people are proposing that. Can you, can you realize that? Can you not realize what's going on in our world? Yeah. It's that bad. It's so stupid nowadays. But that was the point why you're called woman. Because you are made from man. Just like this, uh, the analogy is that Christians are from the body of God. That's what, that's what must be understood. Why? Because you can't deny history. Okay? You just can't deny history. You can't deny science. You can't deny Bible. Period. That's how it is when you study historically, scientifically, as well as biblically itself, that woman came from the body of a man and God created them both differently. Now, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So we are members of his body, his flesh, and his bones. Now, notice that it says the body of Christ is bones, flesh, and bones. Go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That shows that if we are the body of Christ and he is flesh and bones then what must be understood is that it doesn't say flesh and blood. Did you notice that? It does not say flesh and blood. Well, where is the blood? Well, the blood that the Lord Jesus Christ has shed on Calvary is somewhere else. But that's a totally different teaching, which I won't discuss. <clears throat> but the blood is not in him right now. Right now, Jesus Christ's body is flesh and bones. He don't have blood. You might say, where'd you get that idea from? Because blood cannot go to heaven. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we will read verse 50. For, for now I, uh, bleh, excuse me, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Why? Because uh, God sees blood as corruptible. That's why we need the blood of Jesus Christ, the sinless blood. Not mankind's blood. So then that means when you look at verse 52 and 53, that's talking about the rapture. So when we get raptured, that's why we teach the blood is left behind. So when you get raptured, poof, pool of blood left behind. That will freak out your lost neighbor sitting next to you. And they'll really believe the aliens got you. <laughs> now, we're going to look at the book of Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Notice that Jesus, when he resurrected in his... Remember, blood is not allowed in heaven. So he had no blood. So it says flesh and blood, flesh and blood. But notice the wording that Jesus used. He did not say flesh and blood. Verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not what? Flesh and bones, as he see me have. It doesn't use the wording flesh and blood. Why did Jesus say flesh and bones? Because... The blood's gone. Going back to chapter 5. So, because we are the body of Christ, his body has no blood, we likewise will have no blood ourselves, 
And because 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that blood cannot be raptured up to heaven. Corruption cannot inherit incorruption. Verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Ah, so because of that unity, that unity that I am one with God, that analogy is used with husband and wife. So we are one together, same body, same flesh, etc. So it's because of this cause, at verse 31, shall a man, so a man must leave his father and mother, leave the parents, because you came from their body, right? But now it's starting a brand new body of a family now. Leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. Now you join together with the woman, with the wife. And that's why usually in marriage ceremonies, they say to become one or one flesh. And they too shall be one flesh. They become one. Go to the book of Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. That's why we... We strongly preach against fornication. That must be understood. People in this church should never have premarital sex. That's the reason why I make a big deal about not living together. Right. If you get married, then the man and the woman can live together. Because why? There are always those moments of fornication and the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. That does not bring a good testimony. So that's why it is important that in this church we have absolutely zilch of that. So then it should be where, that's why I always tell some people that that's why I get married as soon as possible if they're in a relationship. Especially if they're quote unquote shacking up. We don't believe in that. Period. So that's, why is that? Why, why, do you, why are you so, uh, such a Puritan, etc.? No, it's not Puritan, it's biblical. Because you've got to understand this. We treat this so seriously. I mean, I don't know how many, I mean, God forbid how many lost people here have done sex before marriage, but you got to realize this. It's pretty much nowadays the normalcy now with young people. It's so bad. And that shouldn't be the normalcy because how many marriage and divorces we just had now? You might say, what do you mean by that? God considers marriage when what? To become one. What do you think sex is? It's when two different bodies can join. That's why God takes that super seriously. God takes this super seriously, and that's the reason why that there's no sex outside of marriage, period. So you've got to realize that, wow, so then it's not where you get through a license and all this kind of stuff. You're right, because it's when two flesh join to one. I had one member in my church getting so guilty and he's like, oh man, then I've done a lot of marriage and divorces and I had no idea. And why didn't anyone tell me about that, right? Yeah, why aren't pastors teaching about that? Uh, you know why? Because practically 80% of their members are shacking up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right, Genesis chapter two. See, I'm not becoming popular teaching this kind of stuff. And I bet you majority of our onliners are hearing this kind of stuff. And they don't like what they're hearing. Especially in this Bay Area, it's so expensive, right? So it's so expensive, that's why there's a tendency where if you're in a relationship, you live together, but you're not married yet. That's wrong. Look, if I can walk by faith all this time, why can't you? I mean, I've done it with two people in the church. And God just miraculously provided. You have to believe and trust in God. Yeah. I didn't move all the way to Texas, and I didn't want to live out here. But I believed what God called me to do, and he blessed it and honored it. Right. Genesis chapter 2. Notice that Paul is quoting from this passage at verse 23. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. See, I told you so about the meaning of woman. Verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Okay, going back to Ephesians. Going back to Ephesians. 
That's why we take, look, some people say, why do you downplay sex? No, we don't downplay sex. We take, uh, sex is a gift from God. I know that's shocking to some of you, all right? But sex is a gift from God. We're not Puritans like you think. You know who's downplaying sex? You guys are. You know why you guys are? You treat it like it's not something that important that you can mess around with it whenever you want. That's your problem. No, we take sex more seriously than you and we value it more seriously than you that we realize that when we combine with one that it's going to be one. Not just one and then two and then another one and two and another one and two. Why do you think God doesn't bother anymore? You know why? Because everyone's just messing up with sex, why not just allow homosexuality, bestiality, and all this? I mean, you're just messing up my gift that I gave to both of you. All right, going back to Ephesians uh, chapter 5. Verse 32. This is a great mystery. Yes, it is a mystery. Man and one truly becoming one and the same together. Now, I know that the world takes that as common sense that both unite as one. But let's be honest, uh, you're not really thinking seriously about that. It is a mystery. How can two actually become one together? It's unless you experienced it yourself. That's the thing with God's mysteries. Usually with God's mysteries, it's something that you don't comprehend or understand until you experienced it. That's why usually God's, a good example is God's plan. God has a plan for you and you're going through a trial and situation. And you don't understand why God, right? And you go, why God, why God? But you just take it by faith that it's true. And then after you experienced it, his plan and his trial for you is no longer a mystery. And you realize, oh, now I understand. And even though you try to explain it as best as you can, the other person hearing it, will never understand, cannot truly understand, will always remain a mystery until what? Until they experience it together. So that's only something that a man and woman, where they became one before, that they can understand. They're the ones that can un truly understand that. S but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So it's a great mystery, and God's saying that the mystery lies, it's not really the man and woman becoming one. That is a mysterious form. But more so what the book of Ephesians is pointing out is God and believers becoming one. Why is that a mystery, Pastor? Do you realize how wicked you are? Do you realize how stupid you are? And that you become one with God himself? Imagine being like Jesus Christ. I mean, uh, I mean, another teaching uh, at 1 John chapter 3, but I don't have time to teach that, is that when you get your resurrected body, you look like Jesus Christ himself. Yeah. Now, who, who do you think you are to take okay. yeah. to look like God himself? Yeah. Why would God even dare to do that? Yeah. You know why? That's a mystery. Yeah. Yeah. That's a mystery. Yeah. Now, there are seven mysteries in your Bible, and we're not going to turn to all of them. Now, this is a must that you should know and write down. This right. is a basic doctrine. All right, the first mystery that you want to know, and this is not all in order, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It's 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And that's the mystery of godliness. Okay, what I will do is I will write it here. And that way the people, they can uh, look it up themselves. All right, it's the mystery of, oh, I said godliness, but it's actually the incarnation of Christ. Right. Incarnation of Christ. That's 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. The next one is the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity. And that is the Antichrist. Right. And that will be found at the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The third one is the mystery of the indwelling Christ. Yeah. The indwelling Christ. That's Christ in dwelling in you. And that is found at the book of uh, Colossians 1. Is that correct? Uh, so I got to look it up real quickly. So okay. I apologize for that one. So it is Colossians chapter 1. And then I'll give you the verse as well. 
It will be Colossians chapter 1. And, and, uh, yes, sir. At verse 27. Verse 27. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27. The fourth one that you want to know is the mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon. And that is found at Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. The next one that you want to know is the mystery of the blindness of Israel. The blindness of Israel. Israel's blindness. That's found at Romans chapter 11 verse 25. Romans chapter 11, 11 verse 25. I mean, some of you wonder, why is it a Jew is one of the hardest people, if not the hardest person, to win to salvation? Didn't you know Muslims are even easier to win to Christ than Jews? I kid you not. Right. I kid you not. Look at those missionaries in Israel. You know what consists most of their members? Not Jews, Muslims, Arabs. Wow, that's a huge mystery. Yeah, that's why the Bible says so. And that's Romans chapter 11 and verse 25. Romans 11, 25. The sixth one is obviously where you got over here, the mystery of uh, the body of Jesus Christ. The mystery of the body of Jesus Christ, which is mentioned. And that's at that passage that we just looked at, Ephesians chapter 5. And then the verse is mentioned there. The sixth one that you also want to keep in mind is that there is the mystery of the rapture. The mystery yep. of the rapture, and that will be the last one. All right, did it catch the bottom? I just want to make sure. Please do not move the camera, though. Does it catch the bottom? Bottom? Rapture? Yeah. All right. So that will be found at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Yeah. Yeah, we shall be changed. All right. So these are the seven mysteries, and they are a must for you to write down and know. You have to know this. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Because the Bible says you are stewards of the mysteries. Yeah. So yeah. you got to realize that you are a steward of God's mystery. You have to take good care of that. And if you don't know your mysteries, then you're not a steward. You're not right. doing your job. So you right. need to know that. Okay, go back to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. And we'll look at verse 33. Verse 33. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular... So Paul says, anyways, nevertheless, all right, at verse 32, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. So Paul's saying all of you men in particular should love your wife as much as you love yourself, okay? If she sees you as a selfish creature, then I think you got to do some serious contemplating on yourself, serious reflection on yourself. Because you got to be treating her well as much as you treat yourself well. See that? So if you're selfish about yourself, there's got to be some of that rubbed off on your wife where she gets that benefit. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. All right, before I come down to the second part for the women, the first part is the men that I want to kick one more time. Notice that Paul, he just does not let that go. That's pretty weird. You notice that he keeps saying that the man, he doesn't give all this advice. He doesn't say respect or honor and anything like that. 1 Peter 3 mentions that. One thing that Paul always mentions is just simply love. Love. That's all he ever said. So then, simply, you know why? Because love is the fulfilling of the law. Right. See, if you truly love, then problem solved. Now, I find it interesting Go to the book of the last chapter in John. Go to the last chapter in John. Do you know how many times love was mentioned by Paul? He mentioned it three times. I find that interesting at the book of Ephesians. Let me uh, read you these verses. All right, so one is at verse 33, right? He mentioned love there. Notice that he mentioned love again for the man to the woman at verse 28. Verse 28, there's your second time there. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. That's the second mention. And then here is your third one at verse 25. Husband, love your wives. Three times. Now, you better take that seriously. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Because 
When God repeats something three times in his Bible, that's what I find interesting. Usually when God repeats something, now not all the time perhaps, but usually when he repeats something, it's three times. You want me to give you some examples? One example, at the throne up in heaven, Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. When they say holy to the Lord, they don't say one time. Yeah. They say three times, holy, holy, and holy. Here's another example. Mark chapter 9 talks about where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. God took hell, damnation so seriously that he repeated it three times. He took holiness that seriously. He took uh, hellfire that seriously. And he takes love that seriously at John chapter 21. Why do you think Jesus asked Simon Peter three times? Lovest thou me? Look at John chapter 21, and notice what Jesus said. Oh, by the way, if you look at verse 14, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples. See, God takes a very special emphasis on three. When you see a re re repetition of three times, that means you better take it that seriously. How seriously? As if your soul was going to burn in hellfire forever. As if God's holiness is at stake. That's how seriously you should be taking with loving your wife. Wow. That's a whole new different standard now, right? <laughs> that'll, that'll put a man right with God. Look at verse 15. Jesus said, asked him if you love, uh, if you love me. Look at verse 16. Second time, do you love me? Third time, verse 17, do you love me? Three times. All right, going back. Going back. That's more than enough of a sermon for the men. They don't need specifics or details. If you take it, it's simple. Let me repeat again. Well, how serious should I take in loving my wife? I mean, I think I love her enough. Okay, you got to take it as seriously as if you would burn in hell if you did it wrong. As if you right. violated God's holiness if you did it wrong. Right. Now, obviously, you're not going to burn in hell. And obviously, that you don't lose your holy standing with Jesus Christ if you... Uh, if you sin men or if you even violate the principle how you should treat your woman because one saved is always saved I'm simply saying that it's that serious where God would repeat it three times So I don't need to give details or specifics, you know All right now the women is at the last part of verse 33 and the wife see that she reverenced her husband So women it is important that you revere you honor you obey your husband. Look, women, you are not showing, it is not respect when you disobey. Can I repeat that again? You don't respect him when you disobey, even if you have your own opinion and you think what is better. It is so important that you have to obey. Uh, remember, the boundary line is unless he disobeys God. I mean, uh, unless, uh, excuse me, unless he causes you to disobey God, right? Unless he causes you to disobey God, causes you to sin that's the limitation right. and it doesn't mean that you can't give your opinion you can give your opinion but the man is the one who makes the final decision he can't go back and forth with you 30 minutes trying to explain things so you got to remember that all right look i know what i'm talking about okay i know what i'm talking about okay all right so you got so that's not reverence i mean in the army i mean if an if a person obeys the leader the leader cannot give 30 minute explanations on something especially when they need to get the job done okay so that's something you got to understand by the way women you're very empathetic creatures if you show a lot of empathy then you should be able to use that what god has given you to you to emphasize with the husband when you do that you don't have to keep objecting or demand an explanation. You know why he did that. Okay? Now, going back to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, notice, see, I just, uh, I just slam everybody. Okay? So no gender would like me, period, except Jesus Christ. <laughs> First Peter chapter 3. So it, why, why do I preach like this? So that you can have a successful life. Right. And sin has to be kicked. Sin and selfishness is the number one reason 
we have wrecked marriage homes. All right, now 1 Peter chapter 3. The modern Bibles, because they respect women so well, they actually say that uh, the, the King James Bible says, show reverence to the wife. But the modern Bibles, they say, be afraid, be terrorized, fear, you know. Now, look what the Bible says about that. Women should not live in terror with their husband. Look at the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now that's some sort of reverence right there, right? But look at the last part. Whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well, and are what? Not afraid with what? Any amazement. The man doesn't do anything that would amaze a woman, catch her by surprise, and then get her afraid. Now, does that make any sense already? So that carries a lot. That already carries a lot of protection and privilege given to the woman. Right. So that is important. If a man does that way, then he has to do some serious self-reflection. Yeah. All right, going back, going back. Some modern Bibles word it as uh, fear. They don't say reverence. They don't say reverence. But notice that Sarah revered Abraham, but did not have fear or terror. All right, going back to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 1. Now let's kick the children, okay? All right, verse 1. Children, all right, now Paul is speaking to children. He's addressing to them. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. So you have to obey your parents. Why? Because it's in the Lord. Now, did you get that? Now, the problem with people nowadays is, they, their number one problem is they have a problem with obedience. That's the problem with everyone. Man, woman, child, I don't care who you are, all right? Man, woman, child, dog, transgendered person, and it or a thing that walks on this universe. Everybody has a problem with obedience. So you have to obey, and why do you have to obey? Your problem is you keep looking at the faults of the people, and that causes you. That encourages you to disobey. When you obey, you can't be looking at the faults of the person because everyone's a sinner. You got to realize God. It's about God. He set that order. Obey this person and that person. And if you disobey God's command on make sure you obey that person, then you're disobeying God, period. It's that simple. So children, when you disobey your parents, you disobey God. That's a, we're living in a totally rebellious day and age where children are brainwashed that they can live independently and parents do not understand their children. And because of that, it encourages a rebellious generation. And that is sin, that is evil, that is wickedness. You got to realize it does not matter if you graduated. Okay, I'm kicking you hard because I understand being a person from that millennial generation. Does not matter if you graduated from college and it does not matter if you're very smart in school and you're well able and gifted. I mean, if you're if you're a child, you cannot disobey the parents God has given to you. Why? Because when you have kids, they're going to be more rebellious than you. Watch. Because every generation gets more rebellious. Right. And they're going to take your genes, where they're going to take your thinking, your mentality, and they're going to become rebellious. Am I already preaching at the parents when I should be preaching at the children? The parents are reaping what they've sown and they understand that. But it's too late for, that, for some of them now. That's why it's so important that you, you kids got to start doing this young so that you don't make the same mistakes that your parents went through. And your family life can be more successful compared, compared to your parents. Now, it's important to understand that now, obviously, we're not saying, well, then if a guy turns 50, and then what if my uh, mom and dad turns 80, and they're not really sane, and they tell me to do something, but it's because they're really old and they're slow, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're suffering Alzheimer's or something. Am I supposed to obey them, whatever they say, even though it's not the right decision? The, God is reasonable. He said the verse children. So, in, uh, so God doesn't mention a certain age. Why? 
because God understands every culture and generation is different on how they perceive the age of a mature adult. See? So it's once when you reach that age of uh, pure adulthood, the age of majority, then you realize that, oh, I'm not a child. So notice it says here, for this is right. Plain and simple. It's right that you obey your parent, period. Obviously, the limitation is the same thing like the woman. If it causes you to sin against God and do something that's not right, then that's where you cross the line and disobey them. Because the point is, at verse 1, for this is right. Why would God tell you to obey the parent and do something wrong? Because he just, because he says, for this is right. God is all about doing what's right. That's it. Verse 2, honor thy father and mother. You have to honor your parents. Show honor to the parents. We live in a day and age, it's totally disrespectful. Totally disrespectful. Now, the thing is, is that I always had a habit of calling some of the brethren Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, especially when I look at the age gap. Uh, American culture is very, very different. But me, I took it very seriously that I got to show them respect. It wasn't until when I became a pastor that it looked pretty weird because I'm their pastor now. But I was in such a habit of showing respect to people who are older than me. So uh, it took me a while to break that habit. However, the point is, is that if your pastor took it that seriously, that's how much you got to realize that you got to show honor toward other people. Now, look, uh, if cultures are different, I understand, and we can uh, refer to each other by our first names. I get that. But me back then, I thought I viewed that as disrespectful. I mean, uh, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, he, uh, there were people calling him, you know, uh, now I know a lot of people would say, Doc, 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 but I appreciate what Pastor Donovan said. Pastor Donovan said that, you know, I don't believe in calling him Doc. That's disrespectful. And everybody was quiet. <laughs> They're like, but I call him Doc, you know, stuff like that. He says, you should call him Dr. Ruffman. And I was the one saying amen because I understood that. <laughs> I understood that. I'm from a different culture. But see, that's how uh, we got to understand. We got to realize that, look, I'm not, call I'm not telling all of you to all of a sudden say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Randall, how are you doing? And stuff like that. I'm not telling you to call them by that type of title or name. But we've lost, but I'm telling you, you've got to recall and you got to seriously self-reflect. Uh, Am I showing them proper honor? Right. That's the key. Am I treating them with proper honor to your parents? Right. All right. They're not your buddy, buddy at college. They're your mom. They're your dad who are your leaders and teachers and who raised you right and changed your diapers. And if they didn't, you would have died in your feces. Yeah. Now, why am I uh, why am I teaching and preaching that hard? Because you you kids are so rebellious, you don't get that through your heads. Right. Now, why should you honor them? Which is the first commandment with promise. That is the first commandment God ever gave that has promise in it. That's why. It has much promise. You might say, what's the promise? Read the next part that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth ah, so that you can have a good life and you can live long on the earth that's the point it's with promise a lot of people like to live long a successful life long life is attributed to obedience you might say how so Look at our day and age. How many kids we got dying so quickly, committing suicide, and etc. You know why? How many? You know why there's so many dying like that? Because they're used to having a, a self mentality, a self mentality. I know that this is hard to hear, but you need to hear this too. Even suicide is a self mentality, and I could say that sadly, uh, it's not something to be proud about, but to try to make People who are suicidal understand that I understand what they're going through because I had that several times in my life. All right, I'm not proud to admit that. You might say, why? Because I understand that kind of mentality. 
is that you're looking at your misery, you're looking at the faults of other people, how they're mistreating you, and that's all you're thinking about. And that's, to be very honest, it's a self mentality. You're thinking about what you lack happiness in life, how you should be well treated. And to be quite honest, that is selfish. But when you have an other's mentality, when you have an other's mentality, then what happens is, is it gets off the pain of yourself, yeah. the weaknesses of yourself, and woe is me, woe is me on yourself. You instead think about other people and understand why the person treated you that way. And it even causes you to forgive a person who may even be in the wrong to you because you understand how why they treated you that way. Okay, so... That is important to understand, and then that's how you can live a long life. Look at, look at all the people who lived rebellious, who disobeyed their parents. When parents tried to refrain their children from hanging with the wrong crowd, with the gangs, I told you not to hang around that. Shouldn't we monitor how you look at social media, your video games? You shouldn't play that level of violence. Look at that uh, sexual imagery. Why do they do that? Oh, because they're, uh, uh, they're a bunch of Puritans. No, so you can have a long life. Gar guarantee, ask all these people who are in prison right now where they started. Oh, it don't just become like that. Right. It's hanging with the wrong crowd. It's looking at something wrong. Right. That's why I hate that television, that internet, that video game stuff, social media, stuff like that. Right. I only use it when uh, necessary to minister to others. And there's nothing wrong with using it for a little convenience here and there. But overall, I hate that thing and I try to avoid that as much as, much as possible. Why? Because you're going to live a very short life <laughs> getting into that stuff. It builds up the suicide tendency too sometimes. It sometimes does that because it gets you in your own world, in self. All right, let's close it off at verse 4. Verse 4. That way it doesn't look bad for the children. And ye fathers, so you fathers, now that's important. So there's something that you fathers should do. Provoke not your children to wrath. That is so important. Is that because you are in charge of your children and they are supposed to obey you in all things, just like the wife does, you men have a responsibility that you don't provoke your children to get angry at you. Okay, so look, I understand the millennial generation, the, uh, the hippies and all those kind of stuff. Why do they come out with that rebellious mentality? You know why? Because their parents did not treat them right. Look, I'm, I'm sure a lot of the children were rebellious themselves, but I guarantee you there's also a huge number of parents who provoke their children to wrath. That's why they came out with that hippie rebellious generation and the millennial generation. You know why? You get so many parents who are negligent of their children, or abusive and I'm serious there's a huge number of that how a, a child can't obey you when you live when you treat them that way they should they should separate from those kind of parents because it's dangerous for them so it's so bad that uh, people have lost their roles see both sides lost their roles and that's why it damages a family right. when both sides perform their roles rightly it performs well now, you don't provoke your children to get angry. This is important. This will be helpful for you. But bring them up. How do you raise them? Key, man, you have this problem. In the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's the same thing with your, with your wife. You men have a problem with patience. I mean, that's why the parent is negligent or abusive. Why? Because... They don't want to take patience in trying to show their child what they did wrong while holding back their temper and always keeping an eye all the time because they will go back to their uh, sin again. That, uh, the excuse is I'm too busy. Yeah. The excuse is I'm too tired. The excuse is my child just doesn't listen to me. Well, your test, uh, that may be true. Your child may not listen to you. But God forbid that it's because you are the problem, not the child. And that's why liberals have a good excuse to teach and brainwash psychologists today that it's the parent's fault, not the child. It makes me wonder about that kind of uh, mess, man. 
makes me wonder that kind of mess. It's so messed up nowadays. It's selfishness. So messed up nowadays. Is that's the problem with parents nowadays is that uh, because they don't discipline themselves and look, who says raising a child is easy? All right, look at my parents. Ask them if it was easy, all right? They had to give up everything, especially my mom took it the worst because women are more a weaker vessel and they're more sensitive, all right? There were, she collapsed in the hospital b before, all right? Why? Because they had to give up their nice home and everything that they sat... They sacrificed to reach their level of riches and to save up money where me and my brother can go to a good school. They gave all that up for the ministry with an apartment that had no air conditioning. But my dad had to keep track of his children and my mom disciplined to keep track of us. Wow. Look, it's not easy raising a child. Who says it's easy? So that's why you, uh, you can't, you know what? I'm talking a long time about this, but this is so important to understand. If you treat marriage so lightly that you just fornicate with all kinds of people, no wonder you take family lightly too. This is the problem. Why do I take a long time about this? Because I don't want you to live a miserable life. Because I guarantee you, I'm probably wrong about this. I'm probably wrong, all right? But 99% of the people hearing this right now are suffering because they did not follow the biblical principle long ago. If you started from a child, if you started from a child, it would have been good. That's why if you're young, I'd start now. I'd start now. So you got to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So you got to nourish them. Uh, you got to nurture them. Yeah, uh, babies, whenever they cry, what do you do? You don't just slap them all the time and say, shut up. You don't just neglect them and let them keep crying. You nurture them. And with so much patience in the middle of the night, you try to calm them down, help them understand because a baby cannot understand why. Because they're a baby. Why can't that teenager understand? Well, teenage, teenagers will hate to hear this, but guess what? They have baby mentalities. Spoiled, rotten generation. And you got to understand that you were a teenager like them too. So that's why you have to understand their level and you got to nurture them. But the nurturing is not where you spoil them. Notice this is an admonition of the Lord. Admonition, that wording is so perfect. Admonition is where it's, it's you set them straight, you rebuke them, but it's not provoking them to wrath. Some dictionary says it's a mild form of rebuke. That's important. So there's that firmness, that strictness that, no, well, I don't, I don't like that anymore, blah, 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 blah. Well, tough, I'm sorry. Not like you get angry and then you slap them in the face like 50 times, you know. So you got to realize that uh, it's done in admonition. Now, when you have admonition, then what happens is, is that if the child still rebels so much more, can the rebuke grow in more in severity? Yes, it can. Because in Hebrews, uh, we'll look at over here, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The problem with uh, people and parenting nowadays is that you think that you have to start out uh, with a slap. No, it's not starting out with a slap. You got to do nurture and admonition. Let me repeat that again. Nurture and admonition. That way they're not provoked to wrath. Okay? Because it's obvious that uh, if you were to like uh, uh, hit, slap the child in the face for, uh, you know, if they disobeyed you that one time, like, uh, I told you to eat your greens. Why didn't you eat your greens? Bam! Like that. And what happens is then the child becomes angry, obviously angry back at you. Why? Because if somebody slapped you in the face, you slap them back. What if the pastor slapped you in the face? Why didn't you come to church last Sunday? What are you going to do? You're going to slap me back. <laughs> Even though you're in the wrong. See? But what's the point? The point is nurture and admonition. See, you have to start out in nurturing, understanding they're a baby mind and they're fragile. But it's got to be done with that firmness and that rebuke that remains. But it's not done to a severe level, all right? 
If that admonition is ignored, that rebuke is ignored, then the rebuke can grow more in severity. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. And I mean severity. Look at verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the ch thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint uh, when thou art rebuked of him. Look at verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the what? Father chasteneth not. Do you know what chastening means? Chastening is where you have to put in discipline. That's why we talk about spanking children. So that is necessary. Why? Because children can be so bratty and liberals think that you have to talk to them in a way and educate them. And some, you got to realize this. Kids, they're just going to go or they're going to get bored. Sometimes they don't understand what you're talking about. So you got to realize this is that it's done in nurture and admonition. I told you to stop that. I'm going to get uh, that strike one. My mom has a thing. She calls strike one, two, and three, and that really works a lot. Why? That's smart. That's nurture and admonition. But when you, when you hit home run, then it's home run right at the rear end, and you go, ah! But see, that was smart on my mother. That worked. And guess what? Uh, majority of the times... For myself, that spanking was, uh, I didn't have to go through. Why? Because it was started out with nurture and admonition. Yeah, yeah. Understand that? Yeah. All right. If I know parenting is tough, all right? And I know that uh, I should be preaching against the kids about uh, obeying, but I already did my part against the kids. Now I'm dealing with the parents. So this is important for your parents. It's not just men. It's parents. Yeah. Parents have a problem. Why did Paul say fathers? I find it interesting. You know why? Fathers have more of that tendency. God knows men have more of that issue. They have more of that issue. Although there's a good amount of women that have that issue now today, I, I admit that. I admit that. But men, if we realize how men are, what they're made to be, they have more of that testosterone aggressive level toughness. And God says sometimes you got to realize that you got to calm it down. Got to calm it down. Okay. Oh, wow. Time has passed. Sorry. Let's close. God, my Father, I pray today's teachings were a blessing to the hearers. I know I spent a long time talking about family, but it is very important. And I had to park it and explain a little more so that we can take our family life seriously and not live in ruined homes. 99% of us, God forbid, but I think it's true, 99% of us are now living uh, and suffering the consequences of what we have sown. Why? Because we've all did not done our roles and our part. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.